Hi, Tony from all the remote things here today, and I'm with some great friends of mine, Craig Brown and Ranga Nathan. How are you, gentlemen? Good, thanks, Tony. Fantastic. And we've got one in Melbourne and one in India, so that's going to be interesting. This is the first time we've done a triple, a triple here, so that's going to be a, a, a menage a vodcast. There we go. I was very careful how I went around that. So what I'd like to do, as we usually do, is get you to introduce yourselves and where you're from. Let's start with Rangan Nathan because he's the good looking one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm based out of uh, Bangalore in India. And uh, I come from like a civil engineering uh, graduation background. And I did programming for around 12 years. And after that, I uh, moved into most of uh, the engineering management and operations kind of role. And it's been doing that for like around uh, three, four years. And right now, uh, with Everest for more than three and a half years. So that's my background. Yeah. I still. Uh, have like a solution architecture and other kind of uh, skill sets. I don't code much right now, but I'm much into like engineering management, organizational thing, and culture. Yeah. Brilliant. And Craig? Yeah, hi. I've been working in the technology industry since the 1990s, believe it or not. Um, yeah, like I've been a business analyst, a manager, a project manager, a consultant, a variety of things over the years. And uh, these days I'm um, part part founder of an organization and part salesperson and part coach and part all sorts of other jobs that need to be done. Mm. That's brilliant. And that's uh, one of the reasons I got you on here. So just for the for, for those that are listening, uh, Craig and I go back a long way. Uh, he was a BA, I think he was shorting himself in his introduction, a BA extraordinaire, I would have called him. Uh, uh, very uh, influential in, 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 in the, the business analysis scene right across Australia at the time. So don't short yourself on that. And, and we, both, uh, we, we both come from that background, which I think is, is interesting as well. So you gentlemen have a company and that company is called Everest. So let's start with a little bit about where, what Everest does and where Everest came from. And then I want to talk a little bit further into culture and, and a few other things. But let's just start from where it came from. Um, Craig, seeing as I was nice enough to let Ring and Nathan go first. You want to tell us what you, your thoughts on where you started out and how it happened? I was working with a public company and got it got acquired by another big uh, public company. And uh, uh, the scale at which it was going up was very, very fast. Like, uh, And the kind of influence that was required was also very big. Though I like scale, I also like the kind of people and the kind of culture and the kind of influence that I'm making on, which is very important for me. And software engineering as such is very, very religious to me. and which means anybody who is like a very good software engineer, respect them a lot. So when we start scaling and uh, we are working at a very, very large scale, uh, I generally have a view on kind of software engineers I'm working with. Or like when I say software engineering, it's not just engineers, product designers and everybody. And like who are all have for building great products. Uh, now, like when this transition happened, I was not very happy on the kind of alignment of my uh, way of software engineering, which is what was happening. So actually, I was uh, busy with the whole acquisition process, and I took a break and went to like uh, the Everest Base Camp, where I had a lot of time. Like uh, basically, after 5 p.m., you don't have like anything to do. You just sit in your room and think for yourself, or you have a campfire and you go and sit and uh, just uh, chill out in the campfire. <laughs> so that's where, like, uh, when I was doing that for like around 21 plus days, I got uh, a thought process that hey, the, all that I have is like very good connect on software engineers or like the people who can build great software, uh, plus designers and product people. So if you can bring them together, why don't we do great things? Plus I really did not have like a great product idea. So I came back and the first thing I called was Craig and then said like, hey Craig, I'm planning to do this. How about you being part of it? So he took some time and said like, let's do it. So that's how it started. And now we are like here, like with 160 plus people globally distributed. Brilliant. Craig, you want to add to that? Oh, I remember that well. I remember getting the photos from Ray Nathan when he was sitting up in the Himalayas, taking photos of the valleys and the mountains and the hills and the towns and stuff. It was cool to see it. And then when he came back, I've come back from Mount Everest and this is what we're going to do. It was a cool story. Um, and, and I think the other thing that kind of unites us here is like what we wanted to do with the company, which is create a great place to work for people who love uh, you know, I love the craft of building software products and services and, um, you know, and designing great experiences for customers and users. And, and also, 
creating an environment where people love working with each other, right? There's, you know, you know those times where you work in teams where everyone likes everyone else on the team and, you know, and it's fun and you're learning from each other and you're doing great work, like creating that environment, like we've been able to pull it off a couple of times or I have been able to pull it off or work in those environments a couple of times during my career. And I feel like I know the patterns and structures you need to put in place. And I feel Ranganathan knows the same things. And so being able to join forces and, and create an environment that's great for other people to work in, that's kind of what united us and made us want to work together. That's that's interesting as well, because, uh, you know, what, what we see there is is that I know that when you, 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 you talk about you came back from Everest, et cetera, but it was all about the same time as the pandemic as well, gentlemen. So you, took, you didn't just take on a small task there, you took on a big task. You're still going now, obviously, but that was sort of the lightning rod whilst you were trying to create this community and you've added in remote as well because let's face it Regan Nathan's not in the room and you're not in the same room you're not even in the same country so talk to me a little bit about that, that challenge when you were talking it through we, we worked together at that other company for a few years and yeah, you know, we'd flown he'd flown to Melbourne and I'd flown to Bangalore and we'd spent time to each other and our teams were remote and distributed and we had patterns that we knew worked um we also knew of patterns that worked from other work experiences and other history. So we knew we knew what it took. Like, and it's not about physical proximity, it's about like listening and understanding and appreciation of each other and, and making space for that. Now we started Everest, you know, a year or so before the pandemic began. So we had a year's runway before everything became panicky. But um, you know, building in this there's, there's there's little things like building in time to listen. You know, a lot of people when they went into pandemic work mode, uh, you know, calendars filled up with Zoom meetings and, and all that sort of stuff, right? And it's always transactional, right? And you know, I, I I sometimes slide into that trap as well, get too busy and just do one transaction after another. And what I've found over the years is Ranganathan continually reminds not just me but all of us to make time to listen and to spend time with each other as humans, not just do the work. I think that's the underlying most important thing, right? Like appreciate each other as human beings. Sorry, Ranga, I stole your special moment. <laughs> you got any other thoughts you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So there are like two parts of the question, right? One was like scaling and also like pandemic coming in part of it. So one thing that we started was like even before the pandemic, we were remote first. Like as you said, like we both are like not even like in the same room, but like the different countries. And uh, most of our clients are based out of Australia, like because Craig was there and, and in India. So the good thing that uh, happened was like everything that we had to do was like remote first, like from the organization itself. So we had like good plans on how to do work from remote, like all those policies being set and the expectations being clear with all the people. So as we started scaling there, we didn't face much challenges on going remote suddenly. Like that was not a big challenge. And one of uh, like, as soon as pandemic happened, there are a couple of things that hit us, right? Every business, of course. One was like the economical system is hit. That you, you can take it. Like you need to have a runway. How do you like one big thing that we had was strong solidarity within the company. So everybody said that we stand for each other. Let us not leave out anybody else. If you have to take a cut, we'll take like as founders first, then we can take it across the business. Like so, but not like don't leave, we'll not let anybody go. Like we'll keep everybody together as strong as we can, right? So that removed all the fear and anxiety of people, but that also needs continuous and frequent communication across people. That's yeah. the, thing. the second thing is on the distance part, right? Like, so there's uh, Dr. Karen who talks about virtual distance in which she talks about three important aspects of it. One is like the physical distance, which was like become like, you can't work on it at all after the pandemic because we couldn't travel. Maybe. Literally in the same city, right? When we were like working together, we were like around 50 people in the same office. We knew each other very well. And suddenly we couldn't meet. The second biggest dimension was like, like there's a lot of anxiety, but that's along with that, the physical distance. But there are two other aspects of it. One is like operational distance. And the other one was about uh, the affinity distance. So for all these things, operational distance to some extent, you can solve better because a lot of people started moving remote and some people moved to villages, but we said you have very good operational distancing. What I mean by that is, don't generate noise by not having good audio, not having good video. So those kind of things, when you reduce it, like we have a better communication and better attachment. The next one is affinity distance. Of all these three things, if you can just work on that factor of creating emotional connect across people, I think that has a lot more influence. So a lot of time, like what does an automation mean, right? It just means 
you as an individual are like part of different communities. You're part of the country, you're part of the state, you're part of the city, right? Similarly, you're part of another organization. So there are like set of behaviors that's expected out of you. And there's like some financial other systems that run on the top of it. But how do you create that community by reducing that affinity distance? So that was one thing that we worked on. And that helped us like really scale well on during the pandemic. That's a, that's a really interesting thing, because I, I just want to make everyone aware that that journey of yours has, has, has brought you to the attention of, of a number of people around um, making you the best place to work. You, you, you were one of the best places to work in Melbourne startups. And I know from talking to you, that's partly because culture is really something you're both passionate about. And so... I think I really want to ask you, the question I want to ask you around the culture that you've developed is, you know, what, what were the biggest challenges in developing this kind of culture? Right? Thoughts? Um, I think I think integrity is like it's setting out to do it, um, like creating a great place to work is our core mission, right? Like we, you know, we, we work in technology, we like, the cool stuff that you can create, the experiences and the products and all that sort of stuff. That's fun, right? To get involved in that, to see innovation happen. That's cool stuff, right? Um, what's gonna make us particularly different is the way we do it. And we think uh, empowering people, it kind of feels like a cliche to say this, but empowering people to be their best selves is actually a thing, right? Um, when you make people comfortable when you take away the anxieties around like, you know, them standing out or performing in a particular way, when you can make someone feel like their authentic self can contribute, that creates a great contribution. Uh, we, Ranganathan and I, probably have some sort of, you know, views like I would say things like low tolerance for poor quality in ourselves and high expectations of both us and the people around us. And so when we see things not working well, I know this is true for me, and I, through observation, he's nodding, so I know it's true for Ranganathan. Whenever, whenever things aren't going really well, there's an area for improvement, right? We can't fix everything all the time, but the thing that we can fix, uh, the, the, the thing that we need to prioritise to fix is the well-being and, you know, enjoyment and, and, and you know, all that stuff around people's experience, right, because that's the most important thing, right? Yeah, you know, we can have bad processes, but we we've got to have a good experience, right? So we don't have to be, yeah, you know, efficiency is great, but like it's much more important to deliver a platform for people to thrive in. Ryan Yeah. For me, like first important aspect, like again, like growing on culture. I have like always this question, right? Like I moved to a lot of organizations, and many of those organizations started scaling. And one thing I always saw was like the leaders come and say, uh, "Hey, we are planning to go from here to there," which means we are, of course, diluting the culture, right? Once you set that mindset, everybody is under an assumption that we can dilute the culture, like, hey, take things for granted. But what I I always have as a personal challenge, and I, always, like, I think a very good thing that I have is Craig as a comment, is that when we add any, how can we enhance instead of like uh, diluting it, right? What can that person, like anybody adding to a team is actually bringing in some set of strengths. So how can you actually bring them in and then make sure your culture is enhancing rather than reducing. That question is like still, I don't have like an exact answer, but that's one thing we're constantly working on and seeking help from a lot of people uh, within the organization. And of, of course, outside it. Now, coming back on that, we had like a first thing, even when we started, we said like, what is the manifesto on which uh, we are working on? So we have like a set of rules or like, so what is the guidelines? So there are a few things, right? Like how city operates, like in any city, there's a set of rules, like you should not go and kill people and all those kind of stuff, right? Like that, those things are not acceptable. Similarly, organization have some rules where like you can't go into fights and all those kind of things. So of course, we balance on that. Next, everything is about mostly about people, right? Like, so when I say even your clients are people, everybody you're talking to is actually people, right? So then how do you make sure you're bringing in right kind of people? So there are three aspects on which we work on. One is the ability, right? A lot of organizations just focus on the ability and re remove all other dimensions. What I mean by that is like, what are the skills that you have? How much ability you have? Like, so we rate them. So whenever somebody comes for an interview, we are actually judging people, right? So how much are you like uh, at this particular thing? And are you able to sit here or not? Then, but we also are like, I don't know, like I'm not saying for everybody, but many people do this, but we also have the other two dimensions which are very important. 
So some people are not like skilled here, but they have a lot more motivation levels, which means if you can feed in the right amount of knowledge and right of things for right motivation, then they are like very much uh, getting into that right kind of formation. So you have to balance those two to see uh, like if they are like right fit for the organization. The third aspect, which is very important, is we are talking about self-managed organization and we want to scale a self-managed organization. And you remember the question, when we add people, we want to enhance the culture, which means people need to have a lot more patience in things that you are doing wrong or being able to help and own stuff. That comes from alignment. So we always check on people's alignment. A lot of the good hires that we have has very good alignment with the organization. So they are okay with, see, a lot of places, I think, leaders are seen as like uh, ideals, right? But they are not. Many of us make a lot of mistakes. And we need people who can cover up our blind spots. And that comes with alignment. If you don't have alignment, people have less patience. And with this labor market right now across the globe, people start moving and look out for opportunities. The only thing that keeps them together with, along with Ability and motivation is that alignment. So. so let me just dig a bit deeper on that because I, I really like that. When you do what you're talking about, though, it's not all a bit of roses, right? So there's always going to be failures or not the best results that you were looking for in the first place, right? So, mm -hmm. and you, you, you sort of saw that, sort of said that, Craig. I can see you. Yeah. Yeah. Imperfection is everywhere, right? Like, you know, pursuing perfect is just going to kill you, right? But what what you want is evolving and continuous improvement in, in a, a direction that takes you somewhere you want to go. Yeah, yeah. So what I want to just dig a little bit deeper, I, I'm going to ask those hard questions apparently. So I want to dig a bit deeper on some of the, some of the failures or not the greatest results. You know, if, Talk to me about a couple of the ones that that, that that really struck you and that you really had to take some action about because it's interesting just to hear how you looked at those. Would you like to go, or would you want me to? <laughs> <laughs> we've had we've had a couple of customers over the years. We've been in operation for three and a half years now, and in that time, we've had one that I can think of probably two or three customers where it hasn't been a good experience for us. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and I think the essence of that poor experience is a mismatch in expectations, right? So, yeah, we've, we've, we've assumed things about them and they've assumed things about us without us being explicit and clear about it. And as a result, like when things are going smoothly, it's all fine and everyone's slapping each other on the back and congratulating each other. But when you hit the tough parts, where things aren't working well. Um, like I'm thinking of one project where the customer thought we had, we were going to deliver a certain degree of project management expertise and we thought that they were going to, right? And then and then we ran into these environmental problems that were outside what we considered our scope, but were inside what our customer thought was our scope. And so when we run into those frictions, like how do we deal with it? And I remember the team in that instance running into that trouble and it was kind of like the, the, the boiling frog, right? Like it was a yeah, maybe something's not right. Maybe, yeah, it's feeling uncomfortable. Oh, crap, we're in trouble, right? And it took a couple of months to kind of cycle through that. And at that, at that point, you know, we were, we were a smaller organisation at that point. And um, at that point, both Ranganathan and I actively got involved in the project, you know, like Ranganathan helping with the solution design and, and the architecture and you know, managing the bits and pieces that made the thing work and me in terms of managing the customer expectations and yeah, and dealing with the environmental situation that wasn't ideal. Um, and in those, in, in that particular project that I'm thinking of, like I remember our team that were on the ground doing the work, their first reaction was, oh crap, everything's going wrong and we've got to fix it, right? But when we got wind of it, we were able to say, hey, you're not in, you're not in this alone. Like we're here to help you. Yeah. And, and I think that experience, like all the people on that project, um, for us as an organisation, even though it was a rough couple of months, it, it generated a compelling story that that lets us show our team members that we don't just talk the talk, that we deliver on our promises, right? Like if you're in trouble, you're not in trouble alone. We're in it with you and we'll do whatever we can to help you. And that's a, that's that's really admirable. That, and that's part of the reason I wanted to ask that question. So you got you got the failure piece, right? So so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go, okay. So if you take the other side of the coin, what were the, the things that, that worked really successfully for you that you're really proud of and bring it and you 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 get to be the, the good guy? <laughs> so we like again, like if you take the organization itself, there are two main, main important things that we talk about. One is like great culture comes with having like great um 
uh, people. So then it also means great clients, right? So what we said was, can you create an organization which has like a great experience for people to work with as a client and also like people have like this, people should have think that this is the greatest place that they can work with. So what are the things that we can bring in, right? Now, when we have to take that, like let us take, like everything when it's all green, it's all good, right? Like as Craig said, once you hit a point, then there are two directions because what we are saying is we are not just saying like we'll create a great employee experience. We're also creating great customer experience. Whenever you are like a bifurcation, you need to take sides and things are going wrong, right? Then we said like always at this point, we take people's side because we are saying people are the one thing, but how do you also make sure customer have great experience? So first thing is like, the, so we backplay that. And sometimes in the past, one thing we did was when we were like trying to evaluate customers, it's all about like right kind of alignment with the culture. So we being in consulting agency, you cannot say you have a great culture by working with any client and everybody, right? Like because their culture is very much influenced on that particular team. So we need to align ourselves with the right kind of culture, right kind of attitude of the people, right? So then we go ahead and then see and look out for patterns of these customers even before accepting and saying that. The next one is we talk about the ways of working and see how they are doing it. And there are a lot of time, as much as customers, we like customers interview us, we also interview them saying that these are the aspects on which we are looking out for people. And sometimes if they don't align, they're completely fine saying no to them in the beginning rather than picking it up. Even like a lot of times when we are very desperate during the pandemic, we didn't take shortcuts to do these things. And standing on that is very, very hard. Like it's very easy to be said than done because when you're desperate, you're going to take shortcuts and not taking shortcuts during desperate is where like it takes to build better culture. I think during the pandemic, that one big thing that we did was like standing, it was a very desperate situation, but we were standing on that culture and making sure like one of the examples that Craig said was managing that customer expectation was during pandemic. And one of the biggest problems was we couldn't travel and fix the problem there because a lot of them needed physical presence there. And uh, by like it was one of the IoT projects and it also needed us to be physically people. But how do you do it remotely and what are the innovations and creative that you can bring in without showing the people and having that experience? From so yeah, that's something that we so, so I want to dig again a little deeper on that because that harks to leadership, right? And you, you've both touched on it a little bit, but now I really want to dig deeper into to, to the leadership. What's your thoughts on leadership? I want, I want to understand there's a couple of facets to that when I ask this question. What's your thoughts on leadership? You've, you've talked about leading from the front. That's great. So when things aren't great with, you know, we're as leaders, I've been a leader, there's performance management, there's those kind of issues, but there's also, you know, when things aren't going great as well for the organisation, but then there, when, when, when there's the good time. So talk to me a little bit about your thoughts on all of those. Craig, I'll get you to start that one. Well, to me to talk to it, I'm going to have to refer to Rang and Nathan's guidance, <laughs> which is as we grow, it's important for us to uh, spread our risk, right? So we want to be an international company with customers in different geographic regions. We've got customers through Asia, Australia and India at the moment. We've had customers in the United States um, at various times. And over the course of the year or two ahead, we're going to grow our customer base in the States and in Europe. Um, our reason for spreading our customer bases is to mitigate against economic cycles, right? So that we, we, we're a more resilient organization. The same goes for the types of customers that we work with, right? We could very easily sort of, you know, triple the size of our business in six months if we just wanted to throw bodies at pro projects, but that's not what we want to do. What we want to do is grow at a sustainable pace and make sure that we keep the culture integral to what we want it to be. Um, and so that means that we're not going to pursue profit. What we're going to pursue is a great working environment, a great culture and a great company and a great relationship with our customers and, and the ecosystem that we live in. Regan, I think you want to add to that? So for me, again, like uh, we are being a global culture, it means leadership means a lot more different from different regions, right? Once you take a global stand, there is like a difference in leadership across regions. And once you go globally, there are a set of things that you need to have common. So as leadership, when you're like having some common distributed across regions, then you need to take stands on like, like say there are a set of guidelines that are like common across uh, across regions and across countries. But there's also some which are like very much local, right? Like, so I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. Like, of course, you know about this Hofstede's uh, cultural uh, um, dimensions. 
and it's very important to understand that because like uh, a lot of companies like when they are like successful in us they'll try to come and replicate the same thing like hey i'm going to put this budget of 5 million and then put this the same set of people who made successful in new york and i'm going to replicate the same thing in bangalore right but a lot of them go like shook kind of thing like so they because they uh, they do the same leadership styles and they are like perfect leaders in that particular context but they're not perfect here right so what like let me give, be a little bit more on like with examples right so one of the aspects that it says is like what is the culture like say clarity let us take like clarity versus autonomy right? like that's one dimension so so like if i be a leader and then i say like we are not like hierarchical right suddenly you are coming to a region which is like very hierarchical and people are like so i used to work in organizations where like some people come with coat and suit and then as soon as they uh, come into the office they first thing we do is like stand up <laughs> so we are like supposed to stand up like if you don't stand up like everybody gives you like a saying look or they roll their eyes you are in trouble basically <laughs> so <laughs> that where i started like so 20 years back when i saw these things happening right which was very like at the time it is natural right what is nature is all about like who like where you are in, the, in that context once you see the global environment and come back you don't want to stand because you see that hey there is a gap there right so similarly when you see like if you go back to the past when kings or like uh, different kinds of people come so based on the hierarchy their dressing and everything used to change so the, their language of leadership was hey i am carried in this cart and then i have like all this gold and i am like dressed to like a premier person and automatically that Causes the respect, right? But if you just take them and you take a farmer and you dress them the same, you don't gain that uh, like you don't gain that kind of respect that you generally gain, right? So they created that gap, and that gap automatically caused a class structure, and that class structure automatically said that I listen to what you say, right? So that was like that in an evaluation came as a hierarchical leadership and that kind of stuff. So different people in that, which means like a minister has like similar kind of ornaments. or kind of uh, dress but it's a little bit different than that of uh, the king which means it's a little bit lower so all those things are created now like later on if you see it came up uh, where like there like big rooms means like your bigger leader smaller rooms means medium size leader and then you are sitting on the cabins means so, like normal person but for us like for me right again coming back uh, i just take so i will not say that anything is right or wrong right it all means that how how what is your cultural uh, dimension that you are taking and how happy are people right so for us the most important thing is people should have their own autonomy they have to give clear purpose and they should have that great experience so that's the thing now how do you create is creating a balance of taking this local culture and also appreciating what better we can do on the top of it. so that's like that's my particular stay and uh, which means again like i'll give a little bit example to be very clear so for example when i say autonomy when i go to australia and then i say like this is the particular uh, task and then this is the thing and you do it most of the people are like quite senior it also depends on the age and the kind of culture and australia is not a collective society it is an individualistic society so a lot of people are very independent and they come and like take their own decisions now when i see that and then i come and apply it back here i can't do the same so i have to be a little bit more clear based on like say a team which has like a like a kind of like a medium to seniorish kind of uh, experience and then like some sort of juniors you can come and just give a task and say you can be this hey this is the task these are the things these are the deliverables these are the people who are affected and a little bit more specific but still give the core like i said say the core common the autonomy and self management should be given but with more clarity right so that's that's then bring in alignment and align the direction so our job is to keep on aligning the direction and make sure like so like long long ago craig uh, used to say like what's your job and then he used to say i'm a plumber here what do you mean by that so i just go and see bottlenecks and then i just keep fixing it right i think after that your job is just once you create that you're just being a plumber where you're seeing the chaos and going and helping the teams to fix it so the only thing that we do is how are things what is the help what are the things that we can come and help you with? and that's it that's the style that i think pretty pretty much we follow that's fantastic so i'm going to ask a really hard question just because um we've all been leaders in this room over periods of time in different organizations and enterprises um i don't like the word performance management but that's typically the hr um word but i had a great leader who said the hardest job of being a leader 
there are two parts to it. One you've talked about is getting out of the way, giving your people the autonomy and creating their culture for them to make the decisions, et cetera, right? But the second one is giving people feedback when they're not actually um, working to the best way or the organisation is the best way that he put it, rather than performance management. Because you can't manage performance, right? But you can give people feedback on the way they're working in the culture that you're trying to create. So I want to ask that question. How do you go about that? Because you've created a great culture, a great place to work, but you're certainly still going to come across that. And as you scale, you're going to get that. So I might start with Craig on that. I can see Ranganathan was... No, let, let, let Ranganathan talk for first. He's got... <laughs> He's got, his, he's got a story to share. Well, there you go, righto. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I think uh, when we were small, a lot of things were very easy because we were all on the same table, right? Like the performance management was not like a big uh, thing for us. Uh, then once you start scaling, right? Like I think at some point you need to know like how the performance is happening, what are the aspects of it. So one thing we have started doing was like I think we are doing two two aspects of it, right? Like again, going back to the fundamentals, we are like. We want to be autonomous, but we also want to be like very much, uh, like very much directional and aligned on things that we are trying to do. So we want to give clarity, right? Then how do you give clarity on performance when you are like uh, asking them to be autonomous, right? So the thing that we try to do is like, uh, so first there are like guidelines on what good work looks like. So we are highlighting what are the good works. We try to say that hey, this person did this and it's amazing, right? So that's what good culture is all about, like appreciating the right things and then. When there is like something that's not expected, then you go back and tell like, hey, these are the things. And if you see it's a pattern, then we have like common like town halls and other places where we say like, hey, this is not expected. Please make sure this is not happening. And put, so like, again, like you need to fix it at a structural level to make sure things are not failing, right? So there is like things that you do at an extra organizational structure level, which make sure like things are not failing. People are not, so there should be not like a decision blockers. There should not be like uh, other things that become in their way. So a lot of these, Performance management also means that right decisions being taken at the right time. It's a group of people together. So what we said was like we did one thing which is called like this is done by other person in our team called Rick. So he said that let us do skills metrics, which means that let people say where I stand and where I want to go and how I bring in that ability to do that task. Right. So that's one aspect of individual. So skills metric is more about individual performance. So I am trying to do this and I'm here. I want to go there and these are the aspects on which I'm going. So they self-manage themselves and they self-promote themselves. So we don't come and say you are promoted. So they go and say, like, I've done this and this, like it's not again, as I told, structurally it should be foolproof. Like you can't say that this one is there. So I'm like, everybody says I'm principal engineer. You can't do that. So we have like right systems in place. So you put it like so Rick built up a very big team around him who gave a lot of inputs on how it couldn't be a fail, how it could be a fail-proof model. And then that's one self -made. team management. We have like something called team coaches. So it's like why coach versus manager, right? I think Craig has a different dimension. So. But as team coaches, the goal of them, like as we took this from sports analogy, right? So a team coach is more about not only individual, but also like seeing the game. They're not actually playing the game, but they're actually looking at all the aspects. They're seeing the competition, they're seeing their own team and making sure that like, they are getting better. Now, when I say that, they are coming from the aspect of like a NBA or like a, like soccer kind of background, like that's the example. So what they're trying to do is they're making sure the team becomes better and better. So the history of it is like, you know, there's a big competition between like Yale and Harvard. And then once uh, Harvard, like I think Harvard chose uh, to pick a uh, coach first. I don't know, one of them, like who, uh, in 1949 or something, they first put a coach and then they started winning continuously. And then the other one said like, oh no, this is, a, this is the biggest strategic difference. And uh, having great coach is a great strategy for the organization. So hiring great coaches is very important. So that means the team performance is better. Now as an organization, you have like a set of leaders who are responsible for different functions. What I mean by that is hiring function, finance, operations, and different functions, and also disciplines or practices like design itself as a discipline or product as a discipline or engineering as a discipline, quality. Now all these people need to like any decision that they make is at organizational level and has impact at a big level. So for them, what we do is we, we give that high level organizational vision and allow them to like be very open on their own kind of uh, goals. What we say to them is, what is your five year vision on this? And how do you make it shorter for one year, right? And then keep on like, so this at each individual function takes a lot of time from both sides because once you're giving uh, autonomy, it also means that See, you're an orchestrator at this level, right? Like, so you need to make sure, like, 
you can't say that you go and do whatever music you want you need to make sure you need to do music but it should align to the whole uh, like the whole thing right otherwise it becomes noise so to make it and tune it you are working with that particular individual and giving them freedom on that particular notes but also like uh, making sure that they have that broader vision and then getting that things so they do their own kind of um, alignment we fine tune it we keep on like do review continuously once we are there our job is again like just stand back and keep on helping them as team coaches so it's not only us it's like we are like a lot of peers who help each other and for uh, me or also Craig there are other people who help us and like do performance management so that's how we do it there is no like a documentation on other things but we also have like retros on which we like for that functions where we give feedback so we have like monthly catch ups across functions and the disciplines and we go and talk it and like as i said like team individual and other people there's a lot of conversations that happen yeah back to you craig yeah you're on mute there craig so i'm going to use the phrase of 2022 you're on mute. yeah it's <laughs> um somebody was outside making a racket um it, it, it's a uh, for us it's a an evolving process too we're a relatively young organization and new new nodes in our networks keep popping up for instance the thing that we're talking about today is building a new team in southeast asia out of malaysia right so how does that fit into our existing environment and so it's it's a constant process of like you know building something tentative and then going all right it's time to change it right um but uh but there's a couple of things like i'm probably just going to restate some of what Rangan nathan said first of all everyone is given the mission of setting their own career goals and growing their own career path and things like the skills matrix that the crew have put together uh, are about creating maps so that if you're blind to what the opportunities are you've got some tools but that doesn't mean that's the exclusive and only path for you one example of that for instance is uh you know in the in in the skills matrix for the software engineering uh, one of the characters in that crowd decided what he's interested in is storytelling Right? that doesn't exist in the in the skills matrix but he wants to build that up as a competence so how's he going to go about doing that and so it, it is a choose your own adventure model in terms of how you grow professionally the, the second thing is like uh we we know it's really important to create space in your week to reflect and our method for that is uh one of the things that we do assert and we don't force it on everyone but we offer and then sustain it is coaching conversations Right. So coaching conversations don't have to come from a team leader or a coach or anything like that. They can be from anyone in the organization that you choose to work with that wants to create time with you and ask you coaching conversations so that you you are forced to stop, slow down and reflect a little bit. Right. Set goals for yourself. Notice what you've been doing. That's that sort of stuff. And we think that that's a really powerful tool. The third one is we do have the team coaches, which which look at team performance from off the field using that sporting metaphor. The team are on the field, they're the heroes of the game. The coach watches from off the field and then checks in with them on a regular basis and observes and notices things. And also works with our customers on reconciling and sharing, uh, building a shared sense of what's going on and what's important and all that sort of stuff. That includes things. And I think one of the most important things is that includes things like making sure that every team has a clear understanding of what its mission is. Right, what is here to do, and whether it's whether it's pursuing that. So that's the, that's the the general thing, which is generally pointing towards good and growth and better. There is from time to time people that are underperforming. Uh, where do we get signals from that? One is customers, and the other is teammates. And so when people notice that somebody's underperforming, um, we try to broker uh, that feedback into that person pretty quickly. Right. Um, we don't like to mediate it. We don't like to give people a shit sandwich or anything like that. Oh, you're doing really good, but we heard this thing about you. We just say, hey, you know, you're on Tony's team. Tony's really unhappy with the way you perform in meetings or whatever it is, right? And we just deliver it fairly bluntly, right? And we ask them whether they see the situation the same way. And we ask them what they're going to do about it. And we ask them if there's anything we can do to help, right? And we give people the opportunity to remediate things themselves because we believe in accountability and we believe we've employed a bunch of adults. Um, if somebody isn't engaged in trying to make things better, they just don't care or they don't respond, we put them through a proper performance management process, which is like, okay, cool, we're going to work with you on very clear steps and what do you got to do and stuff like that. And if you can't kind of turn it around, well, we'll stop employing you. So it's, you know, it's pretty like, yeah, it's a discipline craft, you know, running someone through that process. Um, and, and it doesn't, it, not, not everyone does that, like just a few of us get involved in that. But like, yeah, we, we do believe that everyone most of the time wants to do their best. 
Um, and sometimes what's happening is they're just not aware of expectations. And we think that most of the time, clarity on expectations and alignment in, you know, how we're going to work and what we're trying to achieve is going to fix most problems, right? Because we've got a pretty rigorous, rigorous recruiting pro process. <clears throat> I'll, I'll say this as well, right? During the pandemic, a lot of burnout, a lot of stress, a lot of kind of mental health issues, right? And so just because somebody is underperforming doesn't mean they're a bad person and not a good employee. Sometimes they need to be told to go take a couple of weeks holiday and just chill out, right? And like, we'll manage the customer experience. Don't worry about it. You just need to rest and look after yourself, right? That's also something that's in the mix. Yeah, there you go. That's fantastic, John. Look, I could ask you a lot more questions, but we're really close to the end of our time. So I just want to say thank you for giving me your time and being on the on the cast with us. How can people get involved with Everest? Rangan Nathan, I think you you were the gentleman who said he was going to answer that question for me. <laughs> so within Everest, there is like some effort that uh, we are trying to do, which is called Everest Academy. The idea of it is like, uh, how do you make sure like one of the community aspect for us is very important. So how do you go broader into the open source community and help them? Or how are the other aspects that you can help other organizations build? What are the knowledge sharing things that you can go back and share with the clients and also learn from them? And also like, uh, how do you make sure like, so we, we like say at a community level, there are a lot of aspects like we want to run meetups, conferences, and a few other things which are done in, we also like have sponsored few conferences to make sure like, we're promoting that kind of community aspects so that's one way to get involved. the second one is like uh, uh like just have a chat with us like so we have like hi at everest engineering so just come and say hi to us definitely one of us will come and respond to you and then like uh, based on your uh, uh, aspect we try to align right people to connect with you and then we, we are like very actively looking into that particular channel and we make sure like uh, somebody right comes and talks to you that's fantastic. Look, thank you again, Craig Ranganathan from Everest Engineering. If you're listening to this cast and you like it, don't forget, like it, subscribe, and most importantly, amplify it. And don't forget, we've got the Remote Agility Framework uh, community now. Go to remoteaf.co and you click on the community button and join us at the remote community as well. Thank you again, gentlemen, for, for being on the cast. Wonderful time, all the remote things. Thanks, Danny. Thank you.